Well, first I want to take an opportunity to welcome everybody here. The uh, Animac Nation has grown to a great number of residential real estate agents across the country, and we refer to our group as the Worksaholic Army, the folks that visit with us in Animac Works all over the country. And it's nice to see so many people online live from across the country today for what will be a week-long coaching journey that we refer to as shark feeding. It's an associate level accountability conversation to help you kind of see the light as to your own personal responsibility as it relates to your income in residential real estate, your responsibilities to your family, to your future retirement lifestyle, to everything that, that's driving your task orientation during any given week and how that will affect your income in any given month or year. Uh, Confucius quote at the bottom, about a 3,500 year old quote I guess, when it is obvious that the goals cannot be reached, don't adjust the goals, adjust the steps that you're taking, the tasks that you're participating in on a regular basis and that's what shark feeding is all about. It's all about personal responsibility. A great big thank you to Annie Mac Home Mortgage, our nationwide sponsor of the Annie Mac Nation and Annie Mac Works. You can learn more about Annie Mac Works at the domain name above left, AnnieMacWorks.com. You can also like us on Facebook if you want to be part of the family. If you're not up to speed with everything that's going on in the Annie Mac Nation, simply go to Facebook and find the, the page called Annie Mac Works. And if you're a broker owner and this is your first time on, if you're not a member yet, go to the broker's private group called National Flagship Brokers. This is our network now. Uh, there's about 2,800 real estate brokerages across the country that participate in the Works Productivity Platform, but there's only a handful of the brokerages that are a member of the National Flagship Brokerage Program. So check it out and get to know us a little bit better in the future. So what we're going to be talking about here over the next week is what we call a coaching relationship. A coach is a person who gets more out of you than you can get out of yourself. And in all the environments that Animac Works manages over the course of the year, and we do hundreds and hundreds of events, we bring in special guests, we bring in best-selling authors, we do professional designations. We never spend any time on my personal biography. We never spend any time on my personal resume. And that's because I don't think it's about me. I think it's about the material. I think it's about the, uh, the content that will drive you to hopefully make better decisions in your residential real estate career. But in this particular environment, if you're going to entrust me with any level of leadership, or coaching responsibility for you personally. I think this is the one environment where I should tell you a little bit about my background because if we can build some trust early that I have some experiences that might be useful for you then we might be able to do some good here in the next three modules. But if you kinda are questioning my motives, if you're questioning my credibility, if you're questioning if I know what I'm talking about, then maybe you won't Go out of your comfort zone and do some things that you don't really want to do. Because isn't that what a coach does to cattle prod, uh, to, to use a carrot and a stick, to induce a sense of task mastery for his football player, for his basketball player, for his Olympic athlete, or for his residential real estate professional. And so if I'm going to be entrusted with a re responsibility of coaching, I'd like you to know who I am, where I come from, what my experiences are. So way back in 1986, about 29 years ago, I became a residential real estate agent for one of the largest brokerages in Florida. Actually one of the top 10, 15 brokerages in the country, Herb Gimblestop, Gimblestop Realty, Better Homes and Gardens. And I used to spend my Friday nights alone in a conference room with a phone. From 7 to 9 p.m. when all my buddies were out partying and all my girlfriends were, you know, waiting to see what was going to go on this weekend, I would make phone calls to for sale by owners and expireds for a couple of hours. And this would set me up for two or three listing appointments for the weekend. And I would often start the conversation 
by saying to the seller, listen, it's 8 o'clock on a Friday night. You were listed with another realtor for six months. Where do you think that realtor is at 8 o'clock on a Friday night? See, I'm a full-time, hard-working, career-oriented real estate professional, and I'm going to be the person who's able to get your house sold for the highest possible price. And I'm the person that can sell it with the least inconvenience to you because I'm a, I'm a, a hard-working uh, professional, if you get my drift. And that would help me book two or three listing appointments every weekend in the earliest days of my residential real estate career. By 1989, I had moved over to Prudential White's Realty, another very, very large and very successful mega broker in town. But I had put together on my own a workbook called How to Present Your Home for Sale. It was a step-by-step -step guide to achieving the highest possible price. I actually had it copywritten. I had it printed. It looks a little rudimentary or sophomoric right now looking at it 25 years later. But for me, this became a quintessential handoff piece to for sale by owners and expireds in my marketplace. I would drop it off at my farming clients that thought they were interested in selling their home and it had a little bio and information on me and it really did go through a step-by-step -step indication of how we can get the top price. In and around 92-93 I moved to Remax, a company called Remax Partners in Fort Lauderdale and I ended up getting awarded uh, some, some some high achievement awards for productivity. Uh, I want to tell you that I averaged uh, between 110 and 160 closings a year for the next dozen years. Okay, I, I felt uh, it's worth telling you that managing sources of business and performing at a high level. Uh, Selling 15 expireds a year, 15 by owners a year, let's say 15 farming uh, properties a year for my geographic farm. I used to run a, a hero direct marketing program for all the firefighters and, and uh, police officers. This is back in 92, 94, 96 when nobody was doing hero direct marketing. I was doing a law enforcement and firefighter appreciation program. Uh, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Sunrise, Margate, and I would sell an extra 15 or 20 houses a year to cops and firefighters. I had a great following from a couple of uh, sphere of influence opportunities, uh, alumni opportunities, church opportunities where I would sell an extra 5 or 10 or 15 homes a year. And then I had my buyer team that would uh, take buyers out uh, with my uh, leads and all together selling between 105 110, 120 homes a year, and in our best years, 160 closings uh, was was uh, a, a really nice achievement. In 1999, I opened my own brokerage, uh, and it was called Exit Team Realty in Coral Springs, Florida. We were Exit Realty Corps International's largest grossing brokerage of all time. That means that nobody in that brand has ever achieved I don't even think half of what we achieved from a productive standpoint. We were number one out of however many offices they had. But what I'm more proud of at the brokerage level is that Risk Media uh, analyzes the top most productive real estate brokerages in the country. And in five short years, we made it into the top 250 brokerages of all time, meaning all of the brands combined, we were in the top 250 brokerages from a standpoint of productivity. We're only a five-year-old brokerage. Now, in 2007, you may know this, the real estate market in Florida changed quite a bit. We went from selling 350 homes a month to selling 35 homes a month. And at that point, we made a decision that we were going to sell the brokerage. We did. And he remained open for uh, seven years after that. He just recently uh, closed it down. Uh, but what we were obligated to do upon the sale of our brokerage was to be in a non-compete environment. We were not allowed to open a brokerage or do anything in brokerage management. So from 2007 to 2009, and this might be the most relevant part of our resume for you to call upon when you're deciding if you want to listen to what we have to say. In 2007, after being a broker and making a million to a year, plus, 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 after being in sales and making a half a million, 700,000 a year comfortably every year, uh, I decided 
that from 2007 to 2009, I was going to practice what I preach. So because I couldn't do anything in the brokerage world, I decided I would just start to call expireds and for sale owners and build a farm area. Uh, my team and I, Carrie is our operations person at, at Works. She was my right hand uh, person. She ran our Red X. She ran our farm areas. She prepared all listing packages. So I had an assistant and we would wake up, and this is no kidding, I hope this is relevant for your decision making whether you entrust us with any level of leadership here. 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. every morning I would call the expireds and for sale owners in my area and I would say I'm sorry to call you so early but I wanted to catch you before you went to work. And I listed 120 homes in seven months. I averaged 17 listings a month for that window and remember I hadn't been in sales in the local marketplace for more than a decade because I had been running my brokerage and I hadn't sold a house in nine or ten years but during that window from 2000 to 2009 we were able to to go back to work doing exactly what you should be doing in your local market and we were able to list 17 homes a month from a, a standing start so I think that that's something that might show you that I've got a 29 year track record for managing realtors and and just so you know when I when I managed realtors at the brokerage we were intensive about personal and professional development we were intensive about business planning we were intensive about source of business uh, management so that we were managing 25 realtors that were making between 300 and a million to a year we had a good solid group of very very productive realtors that we were managing and that was the way that we kind of built our models that we're going to be talking to you about here today and over the next couple of days in 2009 we formed a company called outsource works we were hired on to help manage 106 residential real estate offices 4100 real estate agents entrusted our systems to help build their productivity I want to always make a great shout out to that good-looking group on the right hand side of that picture that's Carrie and I on the left that's Scott Forbes Colleen Forbes and Bruce Forbes on the right and they really put works on the map by hiring works to help manage the real estate offices in Florida that they that they managed we were able to establish an outsource system today associate works helps manage 31,000 realtors in 32 different states and here's the unique thing about our model we don't charge a penny we've never charged anybody any money at the real estate brokerage or at the real estate associate level so we don't have that third party motive to collect a credit card or cash a check at the end of every conversation so we have a unique formula we're able to give 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 with no expectation of return and that is all thanks to Annie Mac home mortgage and their sponsorship of the associate work productivity platform so I wanted to get a little bit into my bio as we enter this coaching relationship I hope I didn't bore you to sleep I wanted you to know where I come from where my passions reside and I wanted you to understand that this isn't for everybody in fact the head coach at the University of Alabama Nick Saban says that mediocre people don't like to be around high achievers that they make them feel uncomfortable and that ultimately high achievers don't like to be around mediocre people either so never the two shall meet <laughs> so if you're sitting here right now and you're already like eh, this isn't really for me I don't want to hear this guy talking about his background I don't want to hear what he has to tell me about my career becoming more productive well there's a chance that it's not a good environment for you and and I would say go ahead and turn off your computer but if I'm gonna give you a big if here if you thought that residential real estate could have made you more money than it is today if you thought that you should have more money in your checking account than you do today if you thought that your retirement account would have more money in it today than it does if you thought that you'd have been able to provide a better lifestyle for your children if you thought that residential real estate could have brought you more monthly income than it's bringing you now 
Well, I'm going to reveal to you why. You're right. You're right. It could have. But you're probably not doing all of the things that the top earners are doing, so you're not getting all the things that the top earners are getting. So we're going to challenge you over the next couple of days to visit with us about some ideas that will for sure, irrefutably, 100% change your income. Now, I've, we've helped a lot of people do this, and it's going to be a challenge for you. So we're going to set this up as to why we call this shark feeding. When I see that photograph of that shark tracking that kayak, and I see that guy looking back over his right shoulder at that shark, I say, oh my goodness. That would probably be the single scariest place to be sitting right now because that shark could take that guy out if he wanted to, couldn't he? Or if you see this surfer and you see in the wave that's right in front of him, that shark right under his uh, eyes, you say, oh my goodness, that is a scary scary proposition and when I think of a shark and the reason we use that that analogy here in shark feeding because there is an alpha and an omega there is an alpha male concept there is an alpha dog concept in shark feeding it says that I'm never gonna go hungry that my family's always gonna eat that I'm always going to be able to hunt to bring back abundance, prosperity, even luxury, even, you know, uh, uh, just absolute abundance to my, the people who count on me because I'm a hunter. And a hunter is different than a bottom dweller. A hunter is different than a gatherer. And shark feeding is all about hunting. So if you're going to join us on this journey, you've got to decide, are you an alpha dog? Are you a person who's got the, the, the get up and go? Do you have that little burning desire in your gut that's willing to do things that the other people aren't? See, if there's 500 people online today, I already know in my heart that 380 of them aren't going to do anything different. There's a couple hundred, maybe 100, 120 people that are going to be stirring. And they're going to say, I need to do something different to affect my income. So if you're one of those people, we've got to challenge you to become a hunter. So the first thing we like to do in the shark feeding conversation is to define for you, once and for all, the difference between a hunter and a bottom dweller. See, a catfish is a relative of a shark. It's actually DNA related to a shark, but it ain't no shark. See, a catfish sits on the bottom and waits for scraps to come down and fall down to them. They don't go up to the surface and look for things and then uh, track it, chase it, and eat it. They simply wait at the bottom for the 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 bits and pieces to fall down from whatever the hunters got. Well, I want to draw that line in residential real estate between people who earn less than $50,000 a year. They're related to top producers, but they're just not top producers. They're waiting for scraps to fall. Lead gen, Craigslist ads, they're waiting for their open house, who's going to walk in. They're waiting for uh, a referral to come from their broker. They're waiting for a friend or family member to call them, but they're not going out and hunting. See, top producers earn over $100,000 a year, and rainmakers in any market earn between two hundred fifty and $2 million a year. Those are the hunters. So drawing this line between the hunters and the bottom dwellers is a responsibility that we have to you to define uh, what we're going to be challenging you to do during the next the weeks that follow shark feeding top producers and rainmakers are hunters there's no doubt about it and hunters are absolutely a different breed um, they walk with a quicker step they have a little bit more sense of urgency even in the pace of their voice in their inflections 
they have a, a particular um, sense of urgency in their eyes and in the way they walk and the way that they approach things. They're very, um, I would say, persistent and dogged. They're a relentless type of a person. And they're single-minded about what they want. So you can't be lethargic, apathetic, slow, and be a hunter. You have to have pace. You have to have a, 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 a kind of like a, 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 you have to be able to put your shoulders back and face fears and anxieties and be dogged. See, most of the producers that I've ever coached or worked with over the past several years are almost obsessive about it. In other words, they get angry at anything that stands in their way. These are the people that, that kind of rocket ship uh, meteoric rise to success in residential real estate. These are the people that can go from a standing stop to taking 15 listings a month in three months. You know what I mean? You have to be pretty obsessive and go out hunt and you have to knock anything that's in your way out of the way real quick. Just as we go into the shark feeding uh, tasks and we're going to move into tasks really quick here. I want to share with you a triptych that was on my wall in my residential real estate office for a decade and it's a quote from Napoleon Hill that really spells out that doggedness that we're talking about that you're going to have to embody if you're going to become uh, one of real estate's elite earners. Every human being who reaches the age and understanding of the purpose for money wishes for it and we could add in the word realtor every realtor that gets a license wishes for money that's why you got your license but wishing will not bring money desiring income desiring riches with a state of mind that becomes an obsession and planning definite means to acquire that money and maybe the most important of all, backing those plans with a persistence which does not recognize, recognize failure will bring riches or will bring money to a realtor. I left that three-piece poster on my wall for a decade because I believe it's the quintessential ideal for the difference between hunters and bottom dwellers, top producers and rainmakers versus average realtors. And if you could kind of start to see yourself as that dogged, persistent, and obsessed person as it relates to hunting, then you're going to see your income rise. Nothing that we talk about matters if you don't have desire. And we could do some cute little Zig Ziglar exercise. We could do a little Tom Ferry, close your eyes and think about what you want. You know, he's copying his dad's coaching plans from 20 years ago. We could do a, a Tony Robbins vision quest. We could do a, a, a dream board like The Secret. But you know what I would do? I would just smack you on the back of the head and say, what do you want? What do you want? Do you want a new car? Do you want to send your kids to a decent college? Do you want to have a beautiful wedding for your daughter? Do you want to have a vacation home that you can visit and be comfortable in? What do you want? Do you want six figures in savings so that when a rainy day comes you don't get nervous? Do you want to stop living paycheck to paycheck? Do you want to build your retirement savings account up to 1.6, 1.8 so that you can provide for your spouse and yourself to have a decent retirement? The intentions of a realtor's heart are deep waters, but a realtor of understanding draws those intentions out. You have to know why you're doing all of these things that we're going to ask you to do, because if there's not a big enough why, then it doesn't matter what we talk about. And my last quote before we get into the tasks of shark feeding is Eleanor Roosevelt, one of my absolute favorite figures in the American historic landscape is my experience has been that work is almost the best way to pull oneself out of the depths of depression, despair, anxiety, if you're fatigued, if you're uh, anxious, if you're mad at your broker, if you're mad at the real estate industry, any 
of the depths of despair, depression, anxiety that you feel as a breadwinner for your family, as a mother, as a father, is this ugly four-letter word called work. Did you ever go to work and then not feel tired anymore? Did you ever go to work and then feel hopeful? Did you ever go to work and have a new sense of purpose because something happened while you were at work that got you excited and engaged? I think that's what Eleanor is talking about. And going to work means doing some things that you don't necessarily want to do, but that you know you got to do. Did you catch that? Work to me is about doing the things that you know you're supposed to be doing, but you don't really feel like doing instead of just doing what you want to do all the time. Well, it's more fun to design postcards on the computer. It's more fun to do some MLS searches for a buyer that ain't even going to buy a house. It's more fun to do a CMA for a family that's thinking about selling six months from now than it is to actually do any real work. So for the past 15 years, we've been using this dashboard. This is an electronic dashboard that we've been using to manage work. And I'd like to introduce you to this dashboard in a way that induces you to take some action. So we take a look at this electronic dashboard and by now every participant who's online today has received a printed version of this dashboard. So if you need to hit pause, if you need to stop for a minute, go out and get your dashboard have a pen in your hand. Don't continue with this class without a pen in your dashboard. There's no point in doing it. A dashboard was emailed to every participant or you can go to animacworks.com and tab down to that little shark where it says shark feeding and you could just go to the dashboard section and print it. I'm going to take just a moment give everybody just that extra couple seconds to uh, see if they can get their dashboard in front of them and then I'm going to suggest that you go ahead and fill it out completely don't worry if you're still grabbing your your dashboard I understand but your name today's date and how much money in gross commission income have you generated in the last 12 months you gotta know where you're at to know where you wanna go right you gotta kinda of see where you've been see where you're at see where you're heading so what's the 12 months of income that you've generated in residential real estate if you're in the business less than 12 months then just put a note there I made you know ninety five hundred dollars in the first three months that I've been in the business or I've made zero dollars in the last six months whatever the case might be so right now if you're a full-time residential real estate agent you probably have some pending files Maybe one of them's a rental, maybe one of them's a listing side commission that you've got coming in. Maybe one of them is a buyer that you sold. But ultimately, that pending transaction has a price. It has the amount of the commission that's affiliated with it. So you should know that. I sold a $300,000 house. Uh, my commission is $9,000. And the closing date is June 30th. So that would be your pending transaction. I did a rental for $1,700. The commission is, you know, $850, and the closing is June 1. Whatever those pending transactions are, I want you to write them down in there. And we're not going to share your dashboards with anyone. So you don't have to worry about anybody looking at it except for your coach. The next thing you need to write down is how many listings do you have? What number of listings are you carrying right now? I have three listings and the total volume of those listings is $400,000. Right? That means three listings, one's 150, one's 150 and one's 100. That's 400,000. So you fill that in on the top right hand corner of that dashboard, the number of listings that you're carrying right now and the volume of those listings which would give us the average price point now any listings that you've taken in the last 30 days I'd like you to write down the asking price of that listing on the left 
You've taken a listing in the last 30 days. You write down the asking price of that listing on the left and the opinion that you have of where it really needs to be on price. Like, what's your opinion of what it's going to sell for? So you have a listing for 154.9, but you think it's worth 135. You have a listing for 179.9, but you think it's worth 170. Whatever the case might be. Or maybe it's priced perfectly. In that case, it's probably going to be sold pretty quick. But you know what I'm asking for now. If you listen, I want the number of listings and the volume that you have in your current inventory. And then I want the asking price of any listings that you took in the last 30 days. And finally, your opinion of the actual retail value, your broker price opinion on that property for right now. Now we're going to go to the center part of the dashboard and we're going to ask you some pointed questions about your activities and your tasks during the last 30 days. Have you performed a staging analysis for any prospective sellers during the last 30 days? Have you went over to somebody's house to talk to them about a pre-listing inspection to give them a free analysis of how to properly prepare their home for sale? Did you talk to them about, you know, their curb appeal or their, you know, their rotted fascia boards or any wood rod on their house? Did you show them how their pool could be cleaned or, or anything about staging or properly preparing a home for the marketplace? Have you done any of those during the last 30 days? Have you written any sphere of influence notes? Any handwritten notes out to your friends or family about residential real estate? Any notes to your, um, your past customers that you've sold a house to? Maybe a little thank you note with a business card in it? Any notes that you've sent out to your sphere of influence? Have you sent out any emails during the last 30 days to your sphere of influence, that's your friends, your family, maybe your past customers. Is there anybody that you have on a recurring kind of newsletter that you've done in the last 30 days uh, to your sphere of influence, your past customers, friends, and family? Have you pulled up anybody who has a home that doesn't live in that home? Those are called absentee owners. Typically, they're landlords or they're vacation homeowners. And those landlord and vacation homeowners, we're going to refer to from now on as absentee owners. So have you sent any notes to any absentee owners in the last 30 days? Have you sent any letters out to the expired listing marketplace in the last 30 days? How many for sale by owners have you met and spoken to in the last 30 days and last but not least and this is stuff is so vital guys if we're going to be friends for more than five minutes you need to participate fully fill in these blanks if the answer is zero put zero but fill them in and then the last one on the middle part of the dashboard is farming hits how many times have you contacted either in print email door knocking, telemarketing, uh, any direct mail to your farm. How many times have you hit your farm in the last um, 30 days? Okay, big piece of the dashboard on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen right now. Have you hung any door hangers on any doors in the last month? Any like just sold door hangers, any just listed door hangers, any thinking of selling door hangers, recipe cards, anything like that. Have you hung anything on any doors during the last 30 days? Have you made any REO applications during the last month? Have you put uh, an application into any of the REO uh, property managers? If you you know if you found out that there's a uh, a HUD opening in your area have you put in any applications now in the past 30 days this is a very intensive piece of the dashboard conversation and it really does serve as an aha moment for many of our real estate partners across the country how many for sale owners have you knocked on their door expireds knocked on their door list pendants meaning they're in a state of foreclosure 
or around a property that just sold for your brokerage or for you, uh, a listing that just sold. How many have you visited and knocked on their door during the last 30 days? And please take the time to fill that in. It's going to help us manage your income for the next uh, week while we're in, involved in this coaching program. Same thing on the telephone and we add absentee owners to the telephone because it's very difficult to door knock on an absentee owner. You're typically going to get no one home because they don't live there or you're going to get a tenant. But in the just sold marketplace, list pending, foreclosures, notices of foreclosure, expiries, for sale owners, how many times have you smiled and dialed during the last 30 days for a particular sector of listing acquisition in our marketplace. Absentee owners just listed, just sold, list pendants, expired or for, for sub owners. So at this point, you should have a listing acquisition dashboard or a shark feeding electronic dashboard that's completely filled in, in its entirety with no blanks empty. If you've done that, you're, you're on your way to building a relationship uh, that's meaningful with a coach because now I can analyze that listing acquisition dashboard and I can help you see the light. This particular photograph really truly resonates with me as it relates to why shark feeding is such an important vehicle to grow your career. You see those fish that hang out under the shark? That's what happens when you become a leader in your marketplace. You start to attract followers. Once you have 30 signs up in your community, then you have agents that are going to want to come to you, work for you as a personal assistant, as a, an apprentice, as a buyer's agent. And you'd be able to command a leadership role in the industry. But until you have 30 signs up, you'll never get that. I mean, I don't care how great you are at technology. I don't care if you spend a fortune on Market Leader. I don't care if you spend a fortune on Zillow. I don't care if you spend a fortune on Realtor.com. You're never going to own inventory until you go out and put signs in the ground. So you, you, you can spend a ton of money on lead gen, but you're never going to command the kind of respect in your local marketplace until you have a good, solid, you know, multi-million dollar listing inventory that you're managing all the time. So we're going to put out the first challenge to you as an individual realtor, and hopefully you're going to see the light of what we're talking about here. If you're going to participate as a listing agent in the real estate industry, you need to go on two to three listing appointments every week. Two to three listing appointments every week are going to create a 10 listing appointment window for any given month. If this is the single-minded focus of a hunter, it's is it possible from Monday morning at 10 a.m to next Monday morning at 10 a.m. for me to go on two to three listing appointments. That's what you have to start asking yourself. Because if you go on 10 listing appointments per month, you're going to get four, five, six, seven listing listings, correct? And if you were taking four to five listings a month, you're going to be making six figures comfortably. In fact, on the lowest numbers we could find, average commissions of about $4,000, you're making $100,000 to $140,000 if you're going on, uh, you know, 10 listing appointments a month and you're taking not less than four. You're taking 48 listings a year. You're doing pretty damn good. And you become a leader. So let's forget about Zillow for a few minutes. Let's forget about Realtor.com. Let's forget about Market Leader and Buyer Leads. Let's start thinking about putting signs in the ground as our primary purpose in the residential real estate business. Because you've heard it all before, list to last. But what I would like to say about this particular cycle in residential real estate is if you put a sign in the ground in 2015, you're going to have more buyers than you know what to do with. Do you agree with me? You know, if, if I put a sign in the ground 
in the summer of 2015, I'm probably going to average three buyer inquiries a week on that sign. Now, if there's no signs allowed, I'm still going to get buyer inquiries from my Realtor.com and my IDX and my posts. And hopefully I'm using my work suite to get my single property websites out there. Hopefully I've got a text autoresponder that's free from my work suite. You know, I've got all these tools. I should be able to generate two or three buyer inquiries per week. So you're never going to have to spend a lot of money on buyer leads if you're just willing to do the work to get listings. So some of you are squirming in your chair right now. You feel a little intimidated. This is a picture we superimposed one of my favorite people in the world, Melinda Harris, out from uh, Laguna, uh, Laguna Hills, California. She actually lives in Southern California. But when I spent some time with her uh, four or five years ago, when she was one of our first shark feeding students, um, she admitted, she was, she, she, she was like, I don't know if I can actually get 10 listing appointments a month. You know, and I've heard that from many, many of our shark feeding students over the years. Is that even realistic, Russ, to go on two to three listing appointments a week? And I would submit to you that not only is it probable and likely, not only is it possible, but it's a foregone conclusion if you just follow a very, very simple formula. And we're going to share that formula with you it's not something that's hard. It doesn't take a tremendous amount of time. But if you're feeling a little intimidated and you don't know where you would get those listing appointments from, I would like to share with you that chum, a chum line, attracts all the hunters. When you're in a fishing boat and you roll out a chum line, and you have a, 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 a bunch of chum behind the boat, you're going to see frigate birds and seagulls that are diving into the water behind your boat because they're looking to pick up those little morsels of chum and bait that you're throwing off the back of the boat. So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not an avid fisherman, but I've done a lot of sport fishing in my life. I live in South Florida, so I get out on the water a little bit. And a lot of people don't know what's below the surface when you create a chum line, a slick like that, across the top of the water, you find that schoolies of mahi-mahi or dolphin, um, sailfish, littler bait fish are, are there underneath the water clamoring for that slick of chum that you put out. What you also notice, if you chum long enough, is that the sharks aren't shy they'll come right up to the propeller of the boat. They'll come right up to the to the chum line itself and they may even hit the bag of chum that's hanging off the back of your boat if it's hanging there long enough to attract this you know school of fish underneath the water then all of a sudden the sharks see the activity and they come up from the bottom. Well this is what we're gonna end session one of shark feeding on. Where is the chum line? that would get you on two to three listing appointments per week. Where is the place that you can go hunt that will guarantee you two to three listing appointments a week? The first place is, and the very first place that you need to look when you want to go on listing appointments is the expired listings that came off the market last night at midnight. The second place is any of the listings that expired over this past weekend or in the last couple of days, they too are the most uh, bountiful source of listings that are in your marketplace. If you go back about a week and you pull up all the listings that expired in a geographic territory, those represent the people in your community that are most likely to relist their house. Those are the people that are going to be putting their house on the market and are interviewing real estate agents. So now you know where the sharks are hunting, right? I sat with Floyd Wickman for two full days when we filmed our modules. And he had a striking conversation about seasoned expireds with me. And he said, you know, in this particular type of market where the seller's are starting to see a lot of activity again you have a lot of expired listings from a long time ago that don't know that the market has improved and that's true in most of the states that we service 
That means that the inventory is moving again faster. So our recommendation is if you want to take listings, go back to the expired listings that expired three to six months ago and talk to them about how the market has improved during the more recent months. So listings that expired even up to a year ago become a very, very hot conversation uh, and all these season expired. So if I knew that somebody had listed their house for sale at the end of 2014 and they expired and they have not relisted their home yet, they become a fantastic prospect for me to talk to. Hey, Mr. Smith, I don't know if you remember me. We spoke almost a year ago when you had put your house on the market. And the reason I'm calling you is that the 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 number of buyers that are actively searching in the marketplace is greater than at any time in the last five years. But the inventory of homes that are available for them to shop for is very, very low. We have an opportunity right now to sell your house for the highest possible price. If you can close by, you know, 4th of July or August while the kids are out of school, whatever the conversation would go, the script or the conversation would go, those are fantastic, warm, door knocking, and telemarketing conversations to have. The next and most obvious chum line in your local market is the for sale owners. These are the individuals that are most likely to be listing their house for sale in the next 30 to 60 days. They typically try selling for sale by owner for a couple weeks or a week or two and they fail inevitably and then it's our job to help guide them towards the MLS as the highest possible price you know they think that they can achieve retail value without being on the retail marketplace and it's just not true uh, for sale by owner buyers often offer much less than asking price because they know that they're not paying a commission so two people can't save the same commission can they you know I'm a buyer I know you're not paying a commission so I want to drop the price a little bit well the seller wants to save the commission so they want to hold the retail so it obviously becomes a conflict or a tug of war and there's not a lot of compromise when egos are that big so for sale owners become a very very uh, reliable source of listing inquiry if you want to go on 10 listing appointments a month all you need to do is break it down to a weekly goal of going on two to three listing appointments a week so if your pro if your brokerage just sold a property on 4th Avenue, it would behoove you, after you've talked to all the expireds, after you talked to all the buy owners, to door knock around the just solds. Hey there, we just sold a house around the corner. If you don't want to door knock around those just solds, then you can telephone survey around those just solds. And last but not least, if you're not getting anywhere with four sale owners and expireds, you've done them all, then you can telephone survey around properties that your brokerage listed. So we just listed a three bedroom uh, around the corner. It's 1,850 square feet. Several of the families that are calling on this house wanted to know if there were any four bedrooms available, something more like 2,200 square feet. I saw that your property was a little larger. Is there any chance you'd consider selling if the price were right? Is there any chance you'd consider selling if we could achieve the highest possible price between now and say the summer while the kids are out of school? Is there any opportunities there? So door knocking around just listed, door knocking around just sold, telemarketing around just listed, just sold. These are the places that the hunters hunt. Delivering newsletters, postcards, and letters are next. And this is the way that we can assure you that you're going to land two to three listing appointments a week. Um, another area that is a very highly hunted area is the list pendants notifications or people that used to be upside down on their house. Maybe in your market, the year is 2006, 2007, 2008. If they bought their home in 2006, 7, or 8, they were upside down for a period of time. Do you know who I'm talking about? The house they bought for 480 that was only worth 350, and then now it's crept back up and it's worth about 480 again. Those are interesting people to talk to because they were demoralized and frustrated that their house had gone down in value, and it's your pleasure it's your privilege to reach out to them and let them know that their house has increased in value and if they're interested in making a move that now might be a great time to capitalize on low inventory and high prices 
people that have their house uh, in some state of foreclosure. And then if you've ever gone to Foreclosure Fridays with us, uh, we still believe that 20-25% of the marketplace is going to be made up of REO and or short sales. So talking to the people that have particular types of mortgages that are more often to be in foreclosure, uh, working with companies like Green River Capital, Keystone, LPS, or even making applications with some of the bigger banks to get involved with their REO departments is still a very formidable way to move your listing inventory. But staying in the sweet spot of the chum line would be let's focus on expired listings let's focus on for sale by owners let's focus on list pendants notifications and just listed just sold uh, contacts so we now have a dashboard of yours that we can look at where you've been during the last 12 months where you're at with pending files where you're at with total listing inventory. We now have a roadmap to show you where to go to get two to three listing appointments per week. And in the words of Ellis Boyd Redding from Shawshank Redemption, now it's time to get busy living or get busy dying. There's going to be a fact that's presented to you during week during session two of shark feeding and that fact is going to be an irrefutable fact it's a proven formula that when worked uh, will produce the two to three listing appointments per week that you need to become a hunter or an inventory acquisition specialist in your local marketplace so the only assignment we're going to give you here off of module one is that you turn in your dashboard. We want you to send your dashboard to us at service at associateworks.com. We want you to send that dashboard into us at service at associateworks.com. Once we have that dashboard, then we're going to get back together in two days for module two, shark feeding rapid fire part two, and we're going to focus on that formula we're not just going to tell you the tasks that you have to do we're going to give you the actual language scripts dialogues objection handling techniques clever conversations uh, really specific questions that you can be asking those sellers when you're in a conversation with them and we're going to give you a proven formula a step-by-step -step, uh, vehicle to take uh, action each week to make sure that you're going on two to three listing appointments each week and we know that that's the quickest way to bring yourself a raise of six to ten thousand dollars a month so the last thing I want to challenge you to do as we wrap up session one take some time today take some time later today in the evening or tomorrow morning and kind of just dwell on what you would do if you had given yourself a six thousand dollar a month raise is there a particular automobile that you would replace is there a private school that you'd want to be sending your son or daughter to is there some Christmas club account that you'd want to fund so that your holidays could be memorable is there a vacation that you want to take in the next six to twelve months is there some retirement savings that you've been remiss with is there a kid that's close to college age 15 17 19 years old that's getting ready to go to college and you know that you need to be bringing in that extra money or is there an ex husband that makes your life miserable because he doesn't pay his child support or his alimony on time and he holds you like hostage because he doesn't pay you and then you're frustrated every month are there any of those situations in your life that could be changed forever by an extra six thousand dollars per month and we hope to see you for session two shark feeding rapid fire continues on wednesday ten o'clock and two o'clock thanks a lot